Salman al-Farsi. Salman al-Farsi, what was his story? Salman al-Farsi was the son of the fire keeper. So his father taught him how to keep the fire going and whatnot. So he would go and take care of the fire and come back home. That's his job. That's the, they are priests of the fire. They're priests of the Zoroastrian or the Majus as we call them. So Salman al-Farsi would go to the, the, the fire and keep on lighting it up. He said, and he's narrating the story himself, he said on the way there, on the road there, there was a monk who had his small monastery. You know the monks had a little cave, they have a monastery. And he would be worshipping, singing his hymns, praying all day and all night. And it intrigued me that this person has a different religion. And I passed by every day and I'd listen to his hymns. I'd listen to his chantings. So, and it was mesmerizing. And it attracted me. So one day I had the guts, the guts to basically go and ask him, can you tell me about your religion? And so the monk began to preach Christianity to Salman al-Farisi. And slowly but surely, Salman al-Farisi realized that what he's doing is idolatry. And what the monk has is a version of Tawheed and worship Allah and whatnot. So he became attracted to Christianity and he secretly converted. He secretly converted. When his father found out, his father locked him up with chains, pre prevented him from leaving the house, tortured him because he's the priest. How can your own son convert to... So it's a big matter of shame. And attempted to exterminate him. So Salman al-Farsi managed to escape from his own house and run away to Syria, which is the land of Christianity. And the monk had already told, the monk had been executed because he converted the son of the priest, so they killed the monk. But the monk had told him that go to such and such a monastery and you will find people of my thought. So Salman al-Farsi went there and then to make a long story short, every time he went, he became the disciple, the main disciple of the monk and the monk taught him how to worship, he, he remained a Christian. When each one died, he would tell him to go to another one. And this happened four times. When each one died, he would say, okay, now you go to this guy. So he went to that guy. He went to, when he came to the fourth one, when the fourth one is about to die, listen to what he says. He says, but my companions who sent you eventually all over to me, my group of people, I don't know anybody remaining upon that understanding of Christianity. We're all gone now. This was the group that we had, but I don't know anybody left upon our understanding of Christianity. But you have come to a time when the promised one is about to come. What did they tell him? They said, you're just about to come to the time when the man that Jesus Christ predicted is about to come. We know it, the signs have been met. What are these signs? We don't know. But these people knew. So they're telling Salman, the signs have all come. And his time is just around the corner. So he told Salman, my advice to you is you go seek this man out. Go seek this prophet out. How? Where am I going to go? I will tell you three signs. I will tell you three signs. Number one, he shall appear in a land that is full of dates. First sign. Go to the land that is known for dates. Number two, he will have a physical mark on his back. In Arabic, we call khatim, and, and, uh, you know, the, the khatim or the seal of the prophecy. I'll talk about this inshallah later on. This is the second sign. Number three, he said that this man will accept gifts, but he's never going to accept charity. He will accept gifts, but he will never accept charity. Salman asked his sheikh died, his teacher died. This is the fourth sheikh now from his house. So we can imagine, you know, he's already probably around 50 years old at this time. So he asked, what is the land that is the most well known for producing dates? He asks in Syria. He is told, the land of Khaybar. Khaybar. Khaybar, which is close to Yathrib. So he asks around. Who amongst you is going to Khaybar? How can I go to Khaybar? So he is told, there are Arab caravans that trade in Damascus here. Get one of the caravans and go to Khaybar. Now, Salman is a monk. He's a priest. He has no money. He has no prestige. He has no clan. He has no society. And so he says to a group of Arab traders, are you going to Khaybar? They said, yes, we're going to Khaybar. Come with us. When they came, when he joined their caravan, they kidnapped him, meaning they, they took him as a slave. So Salman is taken as a slave. 
And instead of ending up in Khaybar, he is sold to a group of Yahud who happen to live in Yathrib, which is later to be called Medina. Because he had that sincerity. And so for decades he toiled in Medina. As a slave, as a 70 year old man, subhanAllah. As a slave, he's toiling in Medina. And rumors began to spread of a man claiming to be a prophet. And rumors began to spread that he's immigrating to Medina. And the Yahud began to be worried in trepidation because they thought this is the king of the Arabs who's coming. And when the king of the Arabs come, then we're in trouble. And Salman, he tells us his story that he was collecting dates from the top of the tree. And he heard his master speak with his brother, the master and his brother, that the king of the Arabs has arrived. This is the first hijrah. The first day of the Hijrah, the king of the Arabs has arrived. He, this he's been waiting for for the last 20 years. He literally jumps down and he runs to his master and says, What happened? Did he come? Did he come? And the master slaps him across the head and says, Go back to your work. What are you worried about? You're a slave. Get back to your work. So Salman goes back, finishes what he's doing. When he finishes the chores that are assigned to him, he takes some of his dates, which was his own food. And he comes to... The Prophet ﷺ, this is on the second, third day that he's in Medina. And he says that I heard that you're a stranger in this town. Here is some charity for you. Puts it in front. Yes. So the Prophet ﷺ tells the Sahaba, Kulu, eat. But he doesn't eat anything. The second day after his chores are over, he brings another plate and he says, Today I have come with you with some date and this is a gift to you. So the Prophet ﷺ tells the Sahaba, Kulu, but he eats as well. So Salman, now his heart is racing. This is a land of dates. He's, you know, one sign has been met. Now what do I do to get to the third sign? So he stands up and he goes behind the Prophet ﷺ, trying to take a peek if he can look into his shirt to see what he can do. And when this old man goes behind the Prophet ﷺ and starts peering and peeking, the Prophet ﷺ understood. So he unbuttoned his shirt and he lowered it. He lowered it behind his back to literally show him the, the, the pigeon mark, the, 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 the khatim. And when Salman saw this, he began crying and he began wailing and screaming. He came and he kissed the hands and the feet of the Prophet ﷺ and he told him his whole story. And the Prophet ﷺ said, we must help you for your freedom. And the, the, the people put an, a ridiculous price on him. When they knew the Prophet ﷺ wanted him, they said, you must give us, I forgot now, is it 150 uh, uh, um, dates, 150 date trees. Date trees. Salman says, where can I get 150 date trees from? So the Prophet ﷺ said, next time it's the season to plant the seeds, call me. So the Prophet ﷺ came with his own hands. He planted 100, 150 of those, those trees, and within a year there was full trees, so he said, here's your, here's your ransom, Salman, you're free. And Salman became a free uh, Muslim by, because the Prophet paid for his ransom through that barakah.